and I was together virtually and uh, sitting outside of a restaurant today. But I asked the Lord to just uh, bless the time that we have together and that the Lord teaches. I could use him to bless our people there for it. I pray you do it, Alan, do it, Ruby, do it, Mark, and Ruth, and Hugh, and Ireland. I pray you touch all the wonderful things. Be yourself. All right, I, I hope everybody can hear me okay. Um, I'm going to start looking uh, this week at uh, one of the arguments that people use against our position. Uh, they, they'll say, well, the, you know, the King James Bible has been revised several times. They'll say, uh, you know, they'll, they'll mention, mention that uh, from, you know, to, to try and indicate that it's okay to continue to revise it. Uh, but, uh, but here's the issue. Um, there, there, it actually has had 10 editions, editions, uh, from the 1850 edition is considered to be the last edition, uh, but there is a difference between revision and an edition. Now, as a printer, I have to know that difference, and, and, I, and I can tell you, a revision is when you take a statement that you have made in a, in, in, in a book or, or a track or whatever, and you change your mind about that statement and you, and you decide that that's not what you meant to say and you go back and you revise your statement. That's a revision. An addition is not a revision. It's a different thing. It's it, an addition is when there's a printer error or there's a, a, a punctuation mark problem or something to that extent. Uh, spelling is wrong. Maybe you accidentally put one paragraph in front of another paragraph and that needs to be reversed. Uh, an addition is an editing of mistakes or, or, or problems with printing or copying or what have you. And so, uh, so yeah, there's, the, you know, you have to keep in mind when, uh, when the King James Bible was originally printed, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Robert Barker was the first printer that, that, that did that work. Uh, and, uh, and it, it, you know, printing was still in its infancy. And, uh, and so, so it was a very difficult early, early printing was very hard to do. I mean, it's, it's still not easy. You still make mistakes. I, I make mistakes every day. Um, uh, and, and, and so you see those things even today with computers and, you know, spell checkers and all the things that we have, and we still have problems. Uh, but, uh, but, but back in, in the 1600s, well, in the, even in the 1400s, whenever Gutenberg first invented his printing press, uh, you had movable type. Um, these were little pieces, little tiny pieces of metal that you had to put, had to lay out on a, on a, on a plank uh, and you laid it out upside down and backwards. And, and so, so it was, it was, you're, you're bound to make a mis mistake as you're doing that. And, and that happened a lot. Uh, so I'm going to outline some of the, some of the unusual mistakes that took place during that time. So you can kind of see the, the things that they're talking about. So when people bring up that argument saying that the King James was revised, it wasn't revised, it was edited uh, because of printer's mistakes. In 1611 to 1613, uh, you, had, uh, you had, some, had some printings that, that came out this way. Exodus uh, chapter 38, verse 10, uh, where it's supposed to have said hooks, H-O-O-K-S, it had hoops, H-O-O-P-S. So, so, that, so that was a spelling mistake. Uh, in, uh, in Leviticus 13, 56, it should have been the word plague, P-L-A-U-G-E, but they accidentally put in the word plain, P-L-A-I-N. Uh, Matthew 16, 35, the word his, the word his, H-I-S, was printed twice in that verse when it was only supposed to be there once. And these are just mistakes while they're setting type. Uh, uh, and notice, too, when you, after you get that type all set, you have to clamp it down and hold it all together and everything and then transfer it to the, to the press. Uh, and so, so, so even if you realize that you had a mistake, if you had, if you had to go in and remove that, that portion, portion and, and fix it, you're basically having to un, unlock your, your plate and starting all over again. So sometimes they may have even, even noticed there was a mistake, but it wasn't worth uh, the hours of time it took to, to tear it down and rebuild it. Uh, but Psalm 69, 32 said, it, it, it said, uh, uh, seek good, G-O-O-D, instead of seek God. They just added an extra O, but you know, obviously that makes a difference. But it's a printer mistake. It's not a. It's not where they 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 changed their mind and said, "Oh well, this is supposed to be another word." It's where they made a mistake in the printing. In the sixteen twenty nine edition, uh, you had Isaiah three thirteen twenty eight said, tra tra "Traveleth as though you're traveling somewhere. Traveleth 
but it was supposed to be travaileth. They changed an E with an A. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and burnt, the word B-U-R-N-T, was changed to burn, B-U-R-N, because uh, they, they didn't intend to put the T in there, evidently, the first time. But notice, uh, spelling, it was a lot of spelling differences even then, too. Spelling had not been, uh, been set yet. Uh, spelling really was only only con put in concrete in 1828 when Webster did his diction dictionary. And so everybody spelled words the way that they felt like they needed to be spelled. Just make, in fact, William Tyndale in his, in his Bible, he would spell uh, uh, you know, lots of words different ways on the same verse sometimes. Um, and so, so, it's, so it's real unusual. They, they talk about you know, the, the, the people against our position, will, will, they'll say that there's all sorts of different, different changes and they'll be talking about spelling and, word and letter changes. The, the letter U in that day, looked like a V and the letter V looked like a U. That's why the word W, the letter W looks like two V's because it's actually, actually that's what it used to look like. That's what the V, the U used to look like a V. And so, uh, so, so it's all, uh, uh, it, it's, it's all just editing and, and, and letter changing and spell changing. Uh, in 1641, uh, it was called the Moore C Bible because in Revelation, 21 1 where it's supposed to be there was no more c they forgot the word no and mistakenly didn't put the word no in there and said and it said there was more c um and 1653 the addition in 1653 the righteous bible because it says the unrighteous shall inherit the earth they forgot to put the put the shall inherit the earth uh so it says the unrighteous shall inherit the earth. Uh, some of them even said uh, uh thou shalt commit adultery instead of thou shalt not commit adultery. Um, there's probably some that really like that version. Uh, but uh, in 1716, it's called the Sin On Bible uh, because in, in John 5, 514, instead of sin no more, it said sin on more. You know, so that's like sin on. <laughs> 1801 in Mark, uh, Mark 7, 27, is, they, they call it the murders Bible because instead of, instead of saying uh, let let the first let the children first be filled. It says let the children first be killed. The F was changed to a K by mistake. Uh, in 1802, First Timothy 5:21, uh, Timothy, I discharge thee instead of I charge thee. You know, he they added a D I S in there by mistake. Uh, in uh, in 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 1824, out of out of my lions instead of out of my, out of my loins. You know, they just transposed the O and the I by mistake. 1810, uh, Luke 14, 6, hate not thine own wife instead of hate not thine own life. Um, and, and so there's lots of different things like that. One, my favorite one is, uh, is in 1701 in Psalm 119, 161. Uh, in, in Psalm 119, 161, it says in the, in, in the, 16, the 1611 press printed, Princes have persecuted me without cause. That's what the verse is supposed to say, princes. But in this version, they accidentally changed princes to printers. Printers have persecuted me without cause. And uh, so, so being a printer, that's kind of a funny one because you know, it really, they, they made so many mistakes. It's almost like they're persecuting the Bible, but you know, it's just mistakes. Uh, so they say thousands of changes were made. Made Yeah, thousands of changes involved spelling errors and and, and uh printing errors and punctuation errors. Uh, so, so these are just things that they had to fix. And inevitably, when you went to fix one problem, you created another, uh, just simply because it was so difficult to set, the, set that type and everything. So, so that's, that's an argument that's a straw man. Uh, you know, we, we still have problems with printing today. Uh, you, you, you can't really look at that. Uh, now, I wanted to start to, to talking too about, uh, uh, you know, we, we looked at the history early on about uh, you know, from, from, from the beginning of the word of God all the way up to the King James Version. So I wanted to kind of go over a little bit of the history after the King James Version. What happened What happened to cause this problem with the modern versions and stuff? Uh, well, the 18, in the 1800s, we call that time, uh, it's known in church history as the, the century of restoration. And uh, basically what you've got is you've got a lot of people started trying to decide if what we had as far as the Bible was concerned was, was really what God said. Uh, and, and what we've been teaching throughout the years is, is that really what God said? And so, uh, so, so this, this time period in, in church history, you've got all the cults are cropping up. And, 
In 1830, you have the Mormon Church with Joseph Smith. In 1831, William Miller, uh, the Millerites, which led to the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Seventh-day Adventists. Uh, in 1832, Alexander Campbell with Church of Christ. In 1863, Ellen White with the Seventh-day Adventists. Charles Taz Russell in 1870 with Jehovah's Witnesses. So, so all of these people are saying, all of these century for all of these centuries, maybe we've been maybe we've been taught wrong. Maybe we need to go back and re restore the truth because we because we've lost the truth. Uh, and in that in that same mentality, you had uh, a man named Tischendorf. Uh, in 1844, Tischendorf was was at a monastery, a Catholic monastery, at the foot of Mount Sinai, and uh, he was looking through old books and old papers and. And he was in the basement once near a furnace, and he saw a, a pile of, of old books that the, that, the, that the monks there had been using to uh, stoke the fire. Uh, and so he went through that little pile of books, and he found an old book. Uh, it was a copy of the Bible. And, uh, and, and so now they call it the Sinaiticus, or the Sinaiticus, because it was found in that particular monastery. Uh, but when he, when he found that, he went through it and realized that there were a lot of differences in that version and that and that book than there was in the in the standard text that people were using in that day so in, so in uh, 1844 he found that manuscript and and that led to to them to a lot of people saying oh well maybe what we've got now is not what we're supposed to have maybe maybe this is the oldest and the best uh uh you know manuscripts and so so they got to looking for more and more of these and they didn't find many but but they did, did soon after that find uh, in the library at the Vatican, uh, in the Pope's library in the Vatican, another one that was very similar to the Sinaiticus, but there's still a lot of differences, uh, and they call it the Vaticanus. Now, these two manuscripts are the two manuscripts that they, that they just fell in love with. They believe because they were, they, they believe they were older, uh, there's really some, there's really some, uh, you know, controversy over their age and and because because of the way they date manuscripts is not uh, is not a very very good way I don't think but regardless they uh, they don't really know for sure but they think it's older than the other manuscripts that they had uh, they they assume it's they're they're in three hundreds or three twenties A D was was when they were copied and so uh, so so Tischendorf and, and these other men they started gathering these manuscripts together and in uh, and in the in the in the early eighteen seventies uh, two men. Who were part of the Church of England? They they approached the uh, the, the people that, that was in charge of the church, and they said uh, said we'd like to go through and and fix some of the problems that, that are in the King James Bible uh, and correct some of these errors that we've noticed based on on on, on some some things that we've seen. And, and they they said, well, go ahead and make make a few changes and run them by us. But what they ended up actually doing, uh, they ended up creating what's called the Revised Version, and that was the very first. Uh, modern translation after King James, uh, and, uh, and and it was made by these two men, Westcott and Hort, uh, uh, Brooke Foss Westcott and John Fenton Anthony Hort. Now, uh, I wanted to kind of go over a little bit about these men, and there's no no better way, uh, I don't think, to uh, to find out what somebody believes than to look at what they actually say about themselves, what the, their own words. Uh, and so so after they passed away, uh, Westcott and Hort, both their sons. Uh, had uh, had went through their letters, their old letters that they had written to one another and to other people, and they pulled out excerpts from those from those letters and and created books called the the Life and Letters of Brooke, of, of Westcott, and there's another book called the Life and Letters of Hort. And so we're, I'm going to read you some excerpts from those books, and so we can see what these men believe because these men, Westcott and Hort, they created the text. Not only did they create the revised version of the Bible, the English revised version. But they also created the 1881 re revised uh, uh, the West Cotton Hort Greek text. So they, they went through and, and eliminated the Erasmus Textus Receptus and started over with the Sinaiticus and Vaticanus and gave us a new Greek New Testament um, that they believed was more accurate. So, uh, so, so this new Greek New Testament uh, is the basis for every single Greek New Testament that's used to even today, the, 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 the Allen. Nestle Allen Greek New Testament is basically a revisiting of the West Cotton Board, and the, those are the texts that are used to create the, the modern Bibles. And so, so these these men are considered to be heroes of the faith by the people who create the modern Bible. So let's see what these heroes of the faith really believe based on their own words. Uh, so here's here's some statements uh, from uh, from Westcott. Uh, this is out of his out of his son's book, uh, writing copies of his letters. 
uh, Westcott didn't believe in the creation. You know, we believe that God created the earth uh, in, you know, in, in six literal days. And Westcott didn't believe in the creation at all. He said this. Uh, he said that, in, that chapters, Genesis chapters 1 through 11 should not be taken literally and, ex, and, accept, uh, and he accepted Darwin's theory of evolution, one of the first Christian theologians that did that. Uh, he taught that Moses and David were not literal people, but were poetic characters. Uh, listen, to, listen to this statement about Moses and, and David. No one now, I suppose, holds that the first three chapters of Genesis, for example, give a literal history. I could never understand how anyone reading them with open eyes could think they did. If, if you feel now that it, it, that it was, to speak humanly, necessary that, that the Lord should speak of the sun rising, it was no less necessary that he would use the names Moses and David and, and his contemporaries used them. Uh, there was no critical question at, at, at this issue. Poetry, I think, is a thousand times more true than history. Do, do we believe that? Do we believe poetry is a thousand times more, more true than history? No, we believe that God's word is true and it's not just poetry. Uh, uh, Westcott didn't believe in miracles. This is, this, is what he, this is what he had to say about miracles. I never read an account of a miracle, but I seemed instinctively to feel it improbability, it's improbability and discovered what somewhat of evidence in the account of it. So in other words, he always looked at a miracle that Jesus performed or anybody or God performed and said, well, I think maybe it could have been this or maybe it could have been that. Uh, you know, for, he, he was kind of the beginning of, uh, of the liberal theologian, uh, theological idea of, uh, of when Moses, you know, parted the Red Sea or God used Moses to part the Red Sea. Well, maybe it was the Reed Sea, which was just a little bitty creek and maybe the wind blew and made it dry and, and they crossed over this little creek, you know, and it wasn't really the Red Sea, uh, you know, and so, so he always looked at, looked at miracles in, in that light. Uh, he didn't believe in the second, that the second coming of Christ was a literal second coming. He says this, as far as I can remember, I said very shortly what I hold to be the Lord's coming in my little book in the historic faith. I hold very strongly that the fall of Jerusalem, of Jerusalem was the coming, which, which was first fulfilled the Lord's words. And as there have been, been other comings, and I don't know what he was talking about there. I cannot doubt that he's coming now to us now and spiritually is what, he's, what he means. So he didn't believe that it's that the second coming of Jesus was a literal second coming. Um, uh, he said he, he didn't believe that heaven is a literal place. Listen to what he says. No doubt the language of the rubric was unguarded, but it saved, saved us that the error of connecting the presence of Christ's glorified humanity with, with place. Heaven is a state, not a place. Heaven is a state, not a place. That's what he said. Um, uh, so, so he doesn't, he doesn't. Now, personally, after reading more, not just these life and letters, more about Westcott and Hork, I don't believe they were saved. I, don't, I believe they were unsaved men. Uh, I don't believe they ever got born again. Uh, and, uh, and so he can say he doesn't believe in heaven and he doesn't believe in hell either, by the way. But unfortunately, that's probably where he is. And, uh, but uh, he was also a socialist, a post-millennialist. Post uh, I won't go through all of that. Uh, he was an environmentalist. He was one of the early environmentalists. Uh, hey, listen to what he said. Listen to what was said in, a, in one of his letters. Uh, he later, he even later disapproved of his father's fishing excursions because his sympathies were so entirely on the side of the fish. On one occasion, being, being then a little boy, he was carrying, he was carrying a fish basket when his father put a fish against his back. You know, he was, he just couldn't stand the idea of fishing. And he, he, was one of the trend and Jesus having uh, said, said to cast the, the net on the side. So, uh, he was very, he was very big on Catholicism. Uh, he believed in, in baptism. He believed in leaders. He supported Marx and everybody that he was contemporary with. He was very big on Mary worship. Listen to this. He was uh, he's, he's a uh, place that, that would worship people where Catholics would worship Mary. He says this, which we discovered in on the summit of a neighboring hill. Fortunately, we found the door open. A screen is a paeta. Uh, 
the, the size of life. A payetta is a statue uh, uh, of, uh, of Mary uh, holding uh, Jesus after he had been crucified. Uh, anyway, he said this, I had been, if I had been alone, I could have knelt there for hours. Uh, this, is, uh, this is Westcott's son speaking, speaking now. This is one statement from him. He said, my mother, whose name was Sarah Louise Wittard, was the eldest of three sisters. She afterwards, at the time of her confirmation, what's confirmation? That's a, that's a Catholic, Catholic thing. At my father's request, took the name of Mary. Westcott had his wife change her name to Mary. That's, that's how big on Mary worship that he was, he was on. Uh, so, and then uh, John Fenton and Anthony Hoare. Here's some statements from him. He hated the Texas Receptus. Now, the Texas Receptus is, is a name given to the, the majority text, which, which our King James Bible is translated from. And he said this about that, about that text. He said, I had no idea till the last few weeks of the importance of texts. Uh, having read so little Greek Testament and dragged on with the villainous text of the Textus Receptus. Think of the vile Textus Receptus leaning entirely on late manuscripts. It is a bless blessing that there are such early ones. Now, even today, when we, when we talk to people who don't agree with our position, they'll say, well, I don't have any problem with the King James. I just don't think it's any problem with anything else. Well, they had a problem with the King James. They hated the King James. Uh, listen to this. This is what he said about uh, about the Bible being historical. He doesn't believe that the Bible is, is historical. This is Hort speaking. I'm inclined to think that no such state as Eden, as the Garden of Eden, uh, ever existed, and that Adam's fall in no degree delivered from the fall of each of his descendants. Uh, he didn't believe that Eden was an actual place. He didn't believe the Garden of Eden existed. Uh, he says this, further, I agree with them, uh, Newman, who's a man he was reading after, in condemning many leading specific doctrines of the popular theology, evangelist, evangel evangelicals seem to me perverted rather than untrue there are i fear still more serious differences between us on the subject of authority and especially the authority of the bible he didn't believe in the authority of the bible what do we say we, we say the bible is our final authority on all matters of faith and practice he did not believe that uh, he was an evolutionist here what he says about darwin um, have you read darwin how i should like to talk with you about it in spite of its difficulties i am think i'm inclined to think of it unanswerable in any case, it is a treat to read such a book. Uh, and to John Ellerton, he wrote, he wrote this, but the book which has most engaged me is Darwin. He didn't say the book that most engaged him was the Bible. He said the book that most engaged him was Darwin's book on evolution. Uh, whatever, it may, whatever may be thought of it, it is a book that one is proud to be contemporary with. My feeling is strong that the theory is unanswerable. If so, it opens a new period. Well, it certainly did open a new period. Uh, he didn't believe that there was a real devil. He did, I, I, I'm not going to read all of these quotes for time to say, say he didn't believe there was a real hell. Uh, he denied the blood atonement. Listen to this. He said, and the fact is, I do not see how God's justice can be satisfied without every man's suffering in his own person, the full penalty for his sins. So, so he, he believed, he believed in purgatory because he believes that everybody has to suffer for their own sins. Jesus is suffering for his sins. Didn't matter to him. Uh, and, and so he believed in baptismal regeneration. Uh, he, he, and they, they both dabbled with the occult. Listen to this. This is Westcott and Hort. They gathered together a, a society called the Ghostly Guild. Listen to what he says. And I have started a society for the investigation of ghosts and all supernatural appearances and effects, being all disposed to believe that such things really ought to be discriminated from hoaxes and mere subjective delusions. We shall be happy to obtain any good accounts well authenticated with names. Westcott is, is drawing up a schedule of questions, uh, and our, our, temp, our, temporary, our own temporary name is the Ghost Guild. And so they started up a, 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 they did seances and all that kind of stuff, trying to decide, you know, what ghosts were trying to tell them. And, uh, and, and so, you know, that's, that's, that's witchcraft, according to the Bible. According to the Bible, they translated it. It's witchcraft. Uh, but they didn't believe the Bible because they didn't believe it had any authority. So they, they weren't worried about that. Uh, so I believe these two men were, were, were lost, and they, and, and they, they uh, more than anybody else, have influenced the modern Bibles that we have today. Not only did they create a new text that all modern Bibles are, are translated from, not only did they, they, they print the Revised Standard Version, but they also have, have printed books, had printed books on what's called uh, 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 modern textual criticism, and they're called the fathers of modern textual criticism. They come up with ideas like uh, 
the, the oldest and best manuscripts are better because they're older and closer to the originals. Uh, and they come up with ideas that when you're reading a passage in one manuscript and it doesn't match the other manuscript, the longer passage uh, should be should be used because it's more likely that the, the copier would have left things out, you know, things like that. Those are all the kinds of main of uh, uh, critical thinking ideas and theories that that the modern translation translators use today. Uh, so they have very much influenced all of that. So uh, they produced that revised version in 1881. Now, in America. There were some there were some theologians in America. They wanted to use use their notes and print an American version of that, which later became the American Standard Version. Uh, but uh, Westcott and Hort wouldn't allow them the rights to use that uh, Greek New Testament uh, until 1901. Uh, that way, that gave them 20 years to sell the the revised version without having to worry about any competition from the American Standard. So 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 if if they truly believed, you know, that this this new version that they had was was so important. Uh, why would they not allow people, they, they did it for money. They wanted to make sure they could sell more of them so that so, so they didn't allow the Americans to print their version uh, for 20 years. Uh, and, and, and so, so that's, that's how, that's how all, that, all that came to play, came place. So, so from that point, from 1881, uh, uh, from 1881 until, until uh, 1901, after 1901, there, they, there was about uh, 20 different versions that you could buy uh, after, 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 up till 19, 18, 1929, I'm sorry, till 1929, about 1929, there was about eight, about 20 different versions that you could buy uh, from 1881 to, to 1929. Uh, and, but then in 1929, they started, they started changing the, the printing, the advertising methods. Now, here's what, I, what I'm about to say. Um, the King James Bible was printed and it, and it was known, it wasn't known as the King James Bible. Uh, it wasn't known as the King James Version. It was just simply known as the Authorized Version. And on the on the spine of the book, it didn't even say that. It just said the Holy Bible. It didn't have Authorized Version on it. But then next to it were the other versions. That if you went to a bookstore, you saw the Holy Bible, and then you saw the Revised Version, the American Standard Version, or this version or that version. There's about 20 different possibilities there. But they all had the word version in there. But they never sold. In fact, all of the all. You know, Westcott and Hort, they lost money on the deal. They didn't make, make any money. Nobody was able to make any money on those versions, you see. But then in 1929, they realized what, what was happening. People, were, people wanted the Holy Bible, so they didn't want a version. So then what they did was they put the King James Version on the spine of the, of the, of the, of the, of the King James Bible, the authorized version. So now it's just a version like all the other versions. And, in, and so that what that did was it, it opened the door for, for the sales to, to start to start getting better. And so from then, from 1929 until today, we've got almost 400 different versions that are available. That's that's uh, almost five per year. It's almost five versions every year that, that they come out with. Uh, and so so it's really beginning to get pretty, pretty ridiculous. Uh, and so uh, so so but that's that's kind of the history. But. From, from the time that the 18, 1881 version was, was created. Uh, now I want to try to switch over to a, 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 a PowerPoint for you. And I'm going to go over some uh, doctrinal errors and doctrinal issues that are affected. Now, now the, uh, the people who, who disagree with our position, they'll say, they'll say, yeah, I know there's a lot of differences, but there's no real doctrinal, doctrinal things that are, that are uh, affected in, our, in, in the new, new versions. Look down at the bottom of the screen there in 1 Timothy 3.16. Um, uh, and without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. Now, we believe that Jesus is God, and his, his, his coming in the flesh uh, is, is, is the incarnation. In the NIV, you'll notice it said, instead of God was manifest in the flesh, it says he appeared in a body. He. Who's the he? You know, and, and, and appeared in, the, in a body. Uh, that's not God being manifested. Anybody can appear in a body. I appear in a body. Even, even looking at, at, at y'all on the screen, you're appearing to me in a body, right? So, so that definitely affects the doctrine of the deity of Jesus uh, because, because we're not hearing God was manifested in the flesh, and, which makes Jesus God. Uh, and then uh, in another deity of Jesus issue, Acts 20, 28. Take heed, therefore, uh, unto yourselves. This is the King James Version. Uh, and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made, had made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he 
hath purchased with his own blood. Who's the he? It's God. God purchased it, purchased the church with his own blood. So it's so so if it's God's blood and Jesus, we know Jesus is the one that, that was on the cross that makes Jesus God. Uh, but in the in the voice Bible, and most of these versions are like this, uh, it says, Shepherd the church, this precious church, uh, which he he made his own through the blood of his own son. You see, you've remo completely removed the deity of Christ in that verse. Instead of saying God was the one who shed his blood, it just says that his son shed his blood. It doesn't say anything about God. So, so you're remo removing the deity of Jesus there. Uh, here's another one. I'm just going to read, read this first part here in Revelation so you can see for sure that it's Jesus talking. Uh, verse 5, and from Jesus Christ. So that's who, who's, who's being spoken, who's doing the speaking, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood has to be jesus verse six and hath made us kings and priests unto god and his father to him be glory and dominion forever and ever amen behold he cometh with clouds that's going to be jesus coming coming with clouds and every eye shall see him that's jesus and they also which pierced him had to be jesus and all kindreds of the earth shall well because of him even so amen verse eight i am alpha and omega the beginning and the ending saith the lord the lord jesus right which is and which was and which is to come the almighty in the New American Standard, for instance, that verse eight, it, 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 instead of saying, instead of saying, saith, saith the Lord, they added the word God. I'm Alpha and Omega says the Lord God, which tries, the, what they're trying to do, and, and, if you, and if you look at some of the other versions too, it's, it's, it's the same type deal. They're trying, they add the word God to try and say that the Alpha and the Omega is not Jesus, but, but God the Father is what they're trying to do, is they're trying to take, take Jesus out of that verse. Um, in, uh, in the RSV, we're, we're going to see in the uh, virgin birth in, in, in the King James in Isaiah 7, 14. This is, this is a doctrine that affects the virgin birth. Therefore, the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall, shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. That's, uh, we all know what a virgin is. It's someone, uh, a woman who is not, not known to man. Uh, in the RSV, uh, we, we read, we read uh, therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a young woman shall conceive and bear. Uh, now, now it is true that the Hebrew word there can be translated virgin and it can be translated young woman. But ask yourself, why would they ever try to translate it as young woman instead of virgin? When, when the verse itself gives you the, the idea, therefore the Lord shall, shall, himself shall give you a sign. A young woman having a baby is a sign that happens every day. But a virgin having a baby, being, being, being pregnant now that's now that's a sign, but but it can't be a sign if just if it's just a one a young woman, uh, and so but here's the thing: this same these same translators, then when they get get to Matthew one twenty three, it says, "Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel." It's being interpreted as God. With this is Jesus, this is Jesus quoting the Old Testament passage that we just read in Isaiah, and and in and in their version in the RSV. They put, they, they go, go verse 23 there, it says, behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son. So they, so in their version in the Old Testament passage, it says young woman. And in the New Testament passage, it says virgin when they're quoting the Old Testament passage. And so it says, because, and the reason they did that is because they had to, because the Greek word for virgin there cannot be translated young woman. It can only be translated virgin. So, uh, so, so that definitely affects, affects that doctrine. Uh, uh, here's another one for the, vir for the virgin birth. Uh, and Joseph and his mother marveled at these things which were spoken of him. Joseph and his mother. But in the ESV and most other modern Bibles, it says, and his father and his mother marveled. Is, is Joseph Jesus' father? No. Joseph is not Jesus' father. Uh, but but in, in the King James, we have it correctly translated, Joseph and his mother. In, in the modern versions, they, they, they try to get away from, try to change the virgin birth to, to be Joseph is his father there. Uh, what about the doctrine of the eternality of Jesus? In the King James in Micah 5, 2, but thou, Bethlehem, Ephrata, that though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall come forth unto me, that is, that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from old, from everlasting. Everlasting is ever, forever. It's eternal, right? From everlasting is eternal. In the NIV, for instance, says, one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from old, from ancient times. Ancient times can, can be in the 1800s. Ancient times can be in the 1500s or 1400s. 
it's not eternal past, like King James says. So, so it affects the doctrine of, so these, these doctrines are affected. Now, you might say, well, that's okay. I understand that in this verse, the NIV changes the doctrine of, eternal, of, of the eternality of Jesus, but I can find it in other places in the, in the NIV. Well, let's say you can find it seven times in the King James but you can only find it six times in the NIV. That has affected the, the doctrine of eternal, the eternality of Jesus. Uh, if you can find it more times in the King James Bible than you can in the modern Bibles, then it's strong, then the doctrine is stronger in the King James Bible. And so, uh, so there, what about the doctrine of salvation itself? Uh, in the King James, uh, 1 Corinthians 1.18, <coughs> excuse me. <clears throat> For the preaching of the cross, to them that perish foolishness, <coughs> excuse me, but unto us which are, are saved, it is the power of God, <coughs> excuse me, which are saved, us which are saved. Now in, in, the, in the Good News translation, uh, for the message of, about Christ's death on the cross is nonsense to those who are being lost, but for us who are being saved, it is God's power, are being saved, not are saved, are being saved. That makes the, the doctrine of salvation a process. There, it, it is a process. Now, this is 1 Corinthians. Paul is writing this. Do you think Paul is saved? Yeah, I think Paul is saved. But it's saying here that for us who are being saved, us would include Paul. If us includes Paul and he's only being saved but not saved, then he's not saved there. And that, when he's writing that verse, he's in the process of being saved, but he's not saved. See, and most, most of the other modern versions do the same thing there. Um, uh, this was a, a good example of, uh, of one look for the message of the cross is foolishness to them, to, uh, to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, being saved, that's the same issue, right? Guess what version this is? This is the New King James. New King James goes the route of the modern translations to, to say that salvation is a process uh, in that verse. Uh, here's another, another salvation verse. In John 3, 36, and the, King, the King James says, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Now, in the NRSV, in most modern Bibles, it says, Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever disobeys the Son will not see life. Well, now, in the King James, it says, Believeth not. But now you're, now you're stuck with obedience as, as part of your salvation. In the NRSV, it says, Who, whoever believes, now they got that part right, but then they said, if you disobey the son, then you won't see life, right? But it's, that's not true. It's not, not, not about your works. It's about belief in Jesus Christ. And so, uh, so that's the doctrine of salvation uh, that is uh, uh, affected by the, by the modern versions. Uh, th there's just so many of these, I couldn't do all of them. Uh, Matthew 27, 35, and they crucified, crucified him and parted his garments, casting lots. Uh, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet. They parted my garments among them, and upon that vesture did they cast lots. So here, here's an, here's a, here's an at, example of, uh, of the modern Bibles affecting the Messianic prophecies. Look here in the NLT. It says, it says in that same verse, after they nailed him to the cross, the soldiers gambled for his clothes by throwing dice. And that's the end of the verse. You see, in the King James, all that that's marked yellow is 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 pointing out the fact that this is a this is a uh, uh, a fulfilling of messianic prophecy by jesus and but in but in the new living translation in most modern bibles they don't include that part of the verse it's not in the alexandrian manuscripts uh that west cotton court and, and the text that west cotton court the greek text that west cotton court uh gave them what about believers baptism and acts 37 uh, and Philip said if thou believest with all thy baptizing but if you'll notice there in American translations and in most modern translations you see verse 36 you see verse 37 38 but you won't see verse 37 it's gone and now now most modern modern Bibles will put it in a footnote or something this particular one I can show you the the I should maybe should have done another picture uh, it doesn't have any footnotes this this is the American translation has no footnotes so they just left verse 37 out with no footnotes and, uh, and, and verse 37 is the strongest verse in the entire Bible on believer's baptism. And that's a, that's a doctrine that, that the Catholic Church killed thousands and thousands of people throughout the years in the past uh, because they didn't 
because they, they would rebaptize. That's why we're called Baptists. We're called Baptists because, because, we, because we turned around and baptized people that came out of the Catholic Church and, and, and came to our, our church. Uh, and then we said, well, the baptism you had as a baby is, is, is not, not any good because only believers can be baptized. And this is the strongest verse in the entire Bible that deals with that. And, and, it's, and it's gone out of the modern Bibles. Uh, so, that, so those are all things that, that uh, affect... Thank you.